uh, I call this meeting to order. Um, thank you for being with us today, finding our new room such as it is. Um, just a couple points. Um, our, the screen over there is where we'll have re remote testimony, and we do have remote testimony today. So as you find a place to sit down, probably see if you can find a, a seat that uh, you can see the, the screen. Um, will be useful. This side of the table, you're much better off. <laughs> you're all good and closer. And if, I, if I could sit down there, I think I would, and then I would be able to see the screen better. Um, so I'm not squinting, just nearsighted. Um, all right, so thank you all. Uh, we do have a quorum this morning, and so we will begin. Um, <laughs> oh, first we were going to do the minutes. No, I was going to say the afternoon. Oh, good. Uh, <laughs> It's been a long week. No, I <laughs> Already. All right. Our first order of business is to approve the minutes from Monday, February 12th. And I will note at this point is that we do have another copy of minutes, which is the corrected version that we approved in the last meeting. Um, so we, we uh, view those as, as having been adopted, and the corrected version now is present um, with showing the, the correct number of people that were there. So uh, I would like to hear a motion from um, Vice Chair Hill. Have you had the opportunity to review the minutes from Monday, February 12th? Yes, I looked them over, and I think we have everyone who provide testimony um, listed here, so I would move their approval. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, Vice Chair Hill moves the minutes from Monday, February 12th. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? The motion prevails, and our minutes from uh, Feb February 12th are now approved. All right. And now we have um, the opportunity to hear House File 3537, which you might notice from the number is uh, one of the uh, uh, lower numbers than we <laughs> than we're hearing this year. So that means it was introduced last year. We did not have the opportunity to hear it, um, but uh, I'm glad that we... Um, on our first official meeting, on a first, uh, first meeting official meeting time, um, this will be the first bill that we hear. Uh, so, um, our bill author is Represent Hodan Hassan. Um, she's not a member of this committee, so um, we will have. If uh, if you're prepared, uh, Representative Lee, would you like to motion House File 2537 before the committee? Our intent is to lay over this bill for further consideration. Yes, Chair, I move House File 2537 before our committee. Thank you, Representative Lee. All right, uh, Representative Hassan, Chair Hassan, welcome to the committee. And uh, would you please introduce yourself and introduce your bill? Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, good afternoon. My name is Hoden Hassan. Um, I am not new to this committee, I'm just new to the room. It was just <laughs> I've never presented in this room, so it looked a little weird. Uh, Madam Chair and esteemed members of the Education Committee, uh, happy Valentine's Day. I also want to acknowledge today is a Remembrance Day for missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, uh, which we heard on the House floor, which is, uh, which is really important. I couldn't find anything uh, red, so <laughs> the closest to red is pink, so I wore pink today. Um, Thank you for the opportunity to present House File 2537, which is an act relating to education modifying the post-secondary education options and amending uh, that statute. It's no surprise that Minnesota has some of the worst racial and ethnic disparities when it comes to education. Uh, if not the worst, some of the worst uh, disparities in the nation. And these disparities start early on, uh, from access to quality of childcare, the credible preschool that gets you ready for kindergarten, and the saga of disparities continue as one enters to navigate through our public education system. Um, if our students um, are supposed to be ready for the world after they are done with, you know, education, uh, secondary education, and you know, tackle the world by attending college, and they are not ready for college or they don't have the means and the accessibility to attend college, then one can say that we're setting our students up for failure. Here is uh, some numbers to shape this conversation. American Indian Minnesotans have 
28% rate of attainment of, uh, for post-secondary education. Hispanic Minnesotans have 29.4%. Black Minnesotans have 38.2%, whereas white Minnesotans have 68.3% attainment in higher ed, which is the highest racial group in Minnesota. If college graduation is how we climb up the ladder of success, if college graduation is how we get good jobs, how we buy houses, how we achieve all of our dreams, then we are failing our future generations of PIPAC students. Which brings us why we need a bill like this, um, why we need to improve the access to post-secondary education options. The provisions in 20 House File 2537 is strengthen the PSEO program in ways that will benefit students of all backgrounds, especially uh, students of color, indigenous students. Number one, it requires secondary and post-secondary institutions who enroll students in PSEO by contract agreement to annually report this to the commissioner of Dep uh, Minnesota Department of Education. PSEO enrolled uh, pupil participation rates, the number of pupils enrolled, and the number of courses <coughs> taken for post-secondary credit. I have a 19-year-old who is in college, and if I didn't know post-secondary education uh, options when he was, you know, taking, when he was in ninth grade, my school didn't tell me. The school that he was attending, he was attending a good school, and the school didn't inform us. But because I knew it, we were able to access that, that option, and he graduated with almost 60 credits, which we didn't pay for it shortens his college years and, and how much we have to pay for. And um, thankfully, we, know we have the resources to pay, but not many people have the resources to pay for it. And college is just a dream that's like really far-fetched for many of young, our young people. Um, another thing that additional uh, proposed language on this um, is centered around ensuring uh, PSO enrolled students have access to scholarship participation uh, participation in leadership and roles, national organizations, just like their high school students do. Um, and then lastly but not least, this provides a greater accountability and alignment of weighted uh, grading policies applicable to both PSEO and concurrent enrollment um, credits earned via coursework. Uh, House file 2537 proposes a rightly um, so to make more equitable the academic experience of our students who engage in PSEO in terms of their GPA, uh, how their GPA is calculated in comparison to their peers who enroll uh, concurrently. With that, I have a uh, couple testifiers who are also going to work us through. Um, one, of, some of the, one of the reasons why I'm carrying this bill is it's from young people and who is better to tell us how to design you know, <laughs> their ed educational ex experience than young people. So with that, I'll have my first testifier introduce himself and we start from there. Please proceed. Thank you, Representative Hassan, Madam Chair, and members of the committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak on House File 2537. My name is Zeke Jackson. I recently graduated from the University of Minnesota and I serve as the Executive Director at People for PSEO, a student-centered nonprofit organization. Our mission is to promote, defend, and expand opportunities for high schoolers through the PSEO program by informing our state communities about the benefits and risks of enrolling in PSEO. We're incredibly supportive of all the different dual credit options, um, but we do specifically represent the interests of current, former, and future PSEO students across the state. Personally, I think that this bill is really needed because I find that many students and parents and sometimes even educators don't fully understand how the PSEO program uh, works in the first place. One of the reasons that I joined people for PSEO and I kind of started advocating for the program was because my high school told me I couldn't go to prom because I was a PSEO <laughs> student. Um, coming from a rural high school, we didn't have any advanced placement classes, we weren't in IB school, and we only had like half a dozen college in the school courses. So PSEO was really the only way for me to earn any significant number of college credits before I graduated from high school. Um, but it should be noted that, especially for small rural high schools like my own, um, the financial, the PSEO funding formula can be really negatively impactful. As stated in the 2023 report by the High School and College Alliance, 
Given the loss in K-12 funding when students elect to participate in PSEO, there's incentive for high schools to try and limit the number of students choosing to take PSEO. This can manifest itself in high schools not making information freely available to students about PSEO, as required by statute, and erecting other artificial barriers to disincentivize participation by high school students and the subsequent loss of funding to the high school. In great part, this bill is in intended to address some of those concerns that have been brought to us by current and former PSEO students, um, and which result in enrollment disparities in the PSEO program. The other speakers, my colleagues um, who have joined me today, can speak more to this. Um, in closing, I'd like to direct your attention to one of the attached materials as well. Um, there's a letter of support which we've included. 14 organizations have signed on in support of this bill, in addition to over 140 individuals. Thanks for your consideration, and I'm also happy to answer any questions about the bill. Chair um, uh, if we had a question, should we ask um, uh, your testifier now or wait till all of the testifiers have presented? Can we just go through the testifiers first? All right, then stay, stay nearby, and maybe we'll return to you. Sounds great. Thank you. All right. Uh, on my list, um, I have uh, Anish and then Rachel as two testifiers, and also Patrice Hanlon. And if they're all <coughs> present, they yes. can start moving their way to the front. And um, as you sit down and settle in, if you would introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, committee members, for taking the time to hear on this bill. My name is Anish, and I am a high school senior at the Math and Science Academy, as well as a PSEO student. I'm also second district chair on the Minnesota Youth Council, a, a legislatively mandated state council devoted to supporting youth advocacy. Our council has seen many issues with school behavior regarding PSTO in the past few years, which have been mainly with PSTO causing students to be barred from participating in too many <coughs> and many ordinary aspects of school. Some schools have prevented their PSTO students from becoming valedictorians or salutatorians. Other schools have prevented students from, from pursuing scholarships that are held for in state schools for graduating seniors. Students should not be forced to make these kinds of sacrifices in order to accelerate their own education. And as it is right now, they are not perfect protected from any of these harmful behaviors. However, with HF 2537, it is ensured that students can receive expanded protections from these policies by providing some form of enforcement against schools infringing on these policies. PSEO students cannot be prevented from joining school honor societies, receiving leadership positions in school organizations, and applying for in-school scholarships under this new bill language. The Minnesota Youth Council supports HF 2537 as a bill that is capable of protecting PSEO students' rights to participate in many typical school activities. This bill will allow for students to continue to stay connected to their school and still take part in these activities, fostering stronger student-school relations. Thank you for your consideration and time for listening to this bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and for joining us today. Welcome to the committee. Thank Please you. introduce yourself and proceed. Good afternoon, committee members, and thank you for your time. My name is Rachel Zaroff, and I'm a senior from Hopkins High School. I'm a second year PSEO student and the president of the PSEO Student Association at the University of Minnesota. I am here on behalf of the association and the hundreds of current PSEO students who I represent to support House File 2537. Some might say that PSEO takes the best and brightest out of our schools, but I'd say that being a successful PSEO student has to do more with ambition. With that, I'd also say that our most ambitious youth are not being supported. A common theme I hear among the hundreds of PSEO students I've interacted with, along with my own experiences, is the lack of support and information for program enrollment. The change proposed in this bill focused on ensuring students are well informed about PSEO is not just beneficial, it is essential. Allowing for an adjusted informed enrollment deadline is only fair. If students are not met with the necessary information in a timely manner from their high schools, they should not have to face the consequences of missing out on the program. In addition, the newly introduced information deadline of October 30th, alongside the current May 30th date, will continue to support students and, sc and schools alike. Allowing students the opportunity to enroll in the spring term of a current school year will continue to promote flexibility and success for hundreds of Minnesota students. 
This bill signifies a step towards accountability for high schools and provides greater opportunity for current and future PSEO students. Thank you for your time and ongoing commitment to the educational success of Minnesota youth. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel, for testifying today. Thank you for being with us. Welcome. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Good afternoon, committee members. Uh, my name is Beatrice Handlin, and I want to thank you for your time today. I am a former PSEO student from White Bear Lake and the vice president of the organization People for PSEO, here to show my support for House File 2537. I want to emphasize the grade weighting aspect of this bill, which will require schools to weigh grades for post-secondary coursework equally to grades earned via equivalent concurrent enrollment coursework. Currently, there is no requirement for schools to weigh grades of equivalent courses the same, even when students are completing the same work, but through different dual enrollment programs. For example, a student takes an introduction to literature class with college and the schools through the University of Minnesota, and the high school weighs it on a 5.0 scale. Another student takes the exact same course through PSEO at the University of Minnesota, but the school decides to weigh it on a 4.0 scale. Even if these students complete the same work and earn the same letter grade, they receive differing GPA scores. When I was a PSEO student, this occurred with several of my courses that overlapped with CIS courses at my school, as it does for students across the state. And by not having equitable grade weighting policies across courses that are equitable, a student's GPA no longer reflects their achievement accurately, which can impact scholarships, class rank, employment, and college acceptance. When I talk to current and former PSEO students, the issue of grade weighting is a prominent concern for students that could easily be rectified by the change in language proposed today. I support House File 20 2537 because it will expand the opportunities for students, protect students from discrimination, and ensure accountability across the state. Thank you for your time and your commitment to education in Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. I do have, we have a remote testifier um, from the public that would also like to come on and speak to the committee. Eric Nelson, principal at Chatfield High School. And if you can hear us, um, please unmute and proceed. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, I'm Eric, Dr. Eric Nelson, the principal at Chatfield High School. I'm also a representative of the Minnesota Association of Secondary School Principals. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about the House File 2537 today. Um, PSEO certainly stands as one of the important components of our educational system. And uh, as um, the House member talked about it being one of the measures that we're using to be able to address some of the educational inequities in the state, and we are supportive of that. Um, I am concerned, however, about various portions of the bill as it's currently written. Uh, principals will be very concerned about the strike through language in section three, subdivision five. The pro proposed changes would remove an eighth grade basic reading competency requirement from the MCA test for 10th graders that are taking higher ed courses. This is concerning to us for multiple reasons. This language would allow low, re low performing readers to engage in complex and abstract coursework that they may not be prepared to handle. PSEO is a great program, but we do not want to set students up for failure. A PSEO grade will stay with that student throughout their entire academic career, and a low grade may result in probation or removal when they do go on to college uh, after graduation. So, we really would like to see that uh, floor of passing a MCA, eighth grade MCA reading test to be maintained for 10th graders doing in P PSEO. Uh, the language change uh, is also kind of counter to the important literacy initiatives that were found in last year's READ Act. I'm not sure why we would emphasize literacy in one act and then gut it from somewhere else. Um, the Minnesota Comprehensive Assessment, which is one of the ways that the students can demonstrate their reading level uh, is already viewed as unimportant by students. The one thing that they do see value in the MCA is that it's their ticket into PSEO as a 10th grader. If this language moves forward, 
uh, as it's currently uh, being proposed to be struck, uh, it will further degrade the student's perception of the MCAs, which is already remarkably low. Uh, finally, the strike through language will mean that the rules for students in public and tribal contract schools will be different from non-public and homeschool students. If you look at section four, subdivision four B, I'm not sure why there would be separate and different requirements for the students that are uh, public and tribal school students compared to uh, those that exist for um, the homeschoolers and the parochial kids. Um, that seems to be both arbitrary and potentially discriminating. In section nine, subdivision 12D, there is also new language that is concerning. The new language indicates that a student withdrawing from a PSEO course would not have a withdrawal included on their secondary, public secondary uh, school record. I support this for a drop, which is typically done in the first week of a new term. I would not support this if a student withdraws from a course well into the term. Perhaps the author is using those terms interchangeably, but drops and withdrawals are very distinct things. Uh, a student that withdraws from a PSEO course will probably not be able to replace that withdrawn course in either their high school or in the college. This hole in a, a student's transcript would be highly suspect and would not accurately reflect their participation in a course. Had a withdrawal occurred in a high school course, there certainly would have been a W grade assigned to a student. Um, I see no clear rationale for uh, differentiating this for college coursework and high school coursework. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Principal uh, Delson, for your testimony. Thank you for the opportunity to, to come today and, uh, and speak to this committee. Um, I think the remote worked pretty well, and grateful for that, that our technical communication people were still able to set up something that works for this room in the basement <laughs> of the state office building. No windows. <laughs> um, but we're getting by. Uh, Representative Hassan, um, I think we can move to member discussion, unless there's any points that we want to address now um, based on the testimony that we just heard. No, let's. Let's just move on to okay. member, member discussion. discussion. <laughs> Representative Mueller. Thank you, Chair Pryor, and thank you, Representative Hassan. I, uh, as a teacher for almost 20 years, I had many of my students who went on to PSEO and how much of a great program that it is. The um, questions that were raised by the principal were two of the questions that I actually had. Um, the one that's the most concerning to me is the withdrawal versus the drop. And um, I did want to just get a little more clarification around that language so that, um, that the, the questions or the concerns that the principal um, through Chatfield addressed was something that we could get a little bit more clarification on. Please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Rep. Mueller. Um, we'll have our testifier um, walk us through that, but I, I believe that um, the first concern that uh, the principal had um, we all know, you know, that MCAs have not been their way of assessing student achievement. Um, I, I know, and I know people are different, have different opinions on this, but standardized testing doesn't work for many of our PIPOC communities. It's Eurocentric view of evaluating education. That's all I want to say about that first uh, comment, but the last one I'll let my testifier speak on. Thank you, Representative Hassan, and, and thank you for the question, and thank you to uh, Principal Nelson for bringing up this important and, point. And if you can also identify yourself as you, oh, as you speak Yes, thank you, thank you, Zeke Jackson uh, from People for PSEO. The, um, the point that Principal Nelson made about the difference between withdrawal and dropping a course is, is spot on, um, and that was the intent and the concern that was raised to People for PSEO, and, and which we brought to Representative Hassan. Um, is that there were some students who would be dropping a PSEO course before the course drop deadline, um, but then would receive an F on the high school transcript, um, despite complying with the, with the college policies on the drop deadline. So um, that, is, that is a suggestion that we are very, very open to, is, is differentiating and, and clarifying the definition on, on that. And can I then ask for to just repeat what you just said, I hope in different words, is that um, 
from our understanding right now that probably we should be using the word drop instead of withdrawal from the course, and that's a correction that, that we can um, look for. They're two different things. And, mm -hmm. They're two different things. Right, so that instead of saying withdrawal, what we want to do, what the, we're thinking is we want to say drop. No, no, no. no. <laughs> No, um, I think what Zeke was just okay. trying to say is that there were students who withdraw from the course prior to the time that they are supposed to withdraw, but still got an F right. in their college, uh, I mean, at their high school trans, isn't that? Yeah. Yes, that's right. So, so they would be dropping the course within the first week or two yes. right. of when the college has the policy, you have, to, you have to drop it by this deadline. Right, mm -hmm. right. And then the important thing being that colleges allow a course to be dropped and there's no it doesn't go on your record it's just a drop but some students they were doing that they were dropping a course within the deadline but it was viewed as a withdrawal I think, and I think they were given thing. they were given an F okay so withdrawal and, and and drop are like two different things in college experience right right so you can withdraw and get a W let's just say right. you you, you were way well into maybe halfway the course and something happened in your life that you can't continue. You can withdraw that and get a W. Mm -hmm. uh, but the drop is much sooner. I think you can drop a class for maybe, I don't know, different colleges. But where I went, maybe the first week or two, I can't remember what it was. Um, and you don't have to get an F. But let's just say you drop a course within that two-week period or one-week period in the college. But you still get an F in your high school transcript. Correct mm -hmm. me if I'm sure. That's, that's And I'm gonna to return to Representative Mueller, Mueller who seems to have uh, worked out what our Well I've been language <laughs> Keeler and I are making yeah. <laughs> Representative Keeler and I are making eyes to each other trying to figure this out since we both have uh, you know obviously some uh, experience with this. I, I think what is necessary in this language is that there are two different terms here that in this language seem to be used interchangeably and that's why or you meant to have a different one and so you know withdraw and drop have to do with academic accountability or with financial accountability as well with what you've taken in the course in college and so making sure that we are taking the correct one is what we want to you know like if you if you drop a course within I think it's two weeks, then you're still not financial, financially obligated to pay for that course. Withdrawing from the class after with the, withdraw, uh, the drop date, I believe you're not academically penalized for that course by the college. And so I just want to make sure that we are, because, because this withdraw and, and understanding that you know, you've taken the course all the way up to almost like finals and all of a sudden, oh crap, I don't know what to do, and then you withdraw. Like, we really want to make sure that we are very specific on what this language is, and I feel like it's a little too mm -hmm. ambiguous for what we're trying, to, for what you're mm -hmm. trying to accomplish. Right? And, and Representative Keeler, I would I would more than appreciate your experience and and insight on this as well. Sorry, thank you, Chair Pryor. And I, I that that clarification being said, in a college situation, if you withdrew from a class, is there a grade on your transcript that counts against your GPA? I believe it might differ on the institution. I know at the University of Minnesota, um, there was like, you'd have like one course withdrawal that you could have and it wouldn't negatively impact your GPA. And after that like first time or maybe second time, then it would impact the GPA. Mm -hmm. um, my understanding is that the, the language or, or the intent that Representative Hassan and I had would be high schools can ha have whatever policy they wanna have for students that withdraw from the course after that course drop deadline. Um, but just preventing the scenario where the students are dropping the course before the drop deadline and getting punished That's for what it. what we're focusing in on. And Madam Chair, I, if this is language is ambiguous, we can maybe work mm -hmm. on it and make it more crystal clear that what we want to do is, what we don't want is that students dropping out, uh, dropping the course within the, within the period that they're supposed mm -hmm. to do and still getting an F from the school. That is, that is the main thing here. So if the language is too ambiguous, yeah. we'll fix it. Mm -hmm. We'll figure it out. And are, are we good on this point, knowing that this is going to get clarified um, 
the point well taken and raised. Oh, I was next in line. Yeah. And I will, yeah, okay, so we will continue with the discussion. Representative Lee. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to just uh, add a point of clarification that might be helpful, just pointing to the language in um, the bill. There's no mention of drop or withdrawal. Um, it's about enrollment, and so um, I'm sure we can work out the details because this bill will be laid over for consideration, but I think that should address the confusion that Mr. Jackson was trying to clarify that at different institutions, um, they may use different terms. Um, I think the, the intent is just enrollment. And so mm -hmm. um, wanted to just help out other members to point out to um, that section in the bill text. Great. Thank you, Representative Lee. Representative Bakeford. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. The, the other piece that, um, and tomorrow I think is our school counselors are going to be here, that, that I had a school counselor reach out to me and talk about specifically PSEO and when students are dropping and enrolling because um, when, when the principal is building his master schedule, uh, students are doing registration and they're planning for whether or not they're going to be in PSEO. So the principal, principals around the state, they're not planning for that student to be in whatever class. And then the districts are actually paying the PSEO institutions for the enrollment that, that they're planning. Then in the fall, what happens is the kids um, decide they're not going to go PSEO. The districts are still on the hook to pay for that even though the student has withdrawn. So just, and it reminded me of that conversation when we were talking about that. So that would be something that we could get some clarification as well. Mm -hmm. Chair Yuki. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Baker. You bring up a good point. I think, though, for clarification again, is you're saying if you drop it within the college amount of time, which you would not be charged for the class, we have to make sure the district's not charged for the class then if the college isn't going to be normally dropped, charging for the class because you dropped it within the specific time. I also heard a concern from the principal about, like you just said, uh, Representative Bakeberg, you know, where do you put that kid if they have to make up that class? Which I understand could be some problems with scheduling. I don't imagine this is happening a ton. And I also wonder, like, you have new kids come to school all the time. Some of our kids, I mean, in one of my districts, we have an elementary school where 50% of the kids that start the school year aren't there at the end. So I know it's hard with scheduling, but I could see where we could probably find some way to figure this out. Well, members, I appreciate the discussion on this point. Um, you have some work, work on and looking at it. Representative Hassan. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, members, for the discussion. We are open to, uh, you know, some suggestions, but what I really want to emphasize is one of the young people who testified said the uh, young people who are doing PSEO are the most ambitious ones, and they are. Uh, this isn't happening so much that, you know, principals would be concerned about so many students wanting to do PSEO and then are dropping out and then the schools have to pay. Like, that's not happening. But what is actually happening is that a student signs up for a PSEO course, uh, they found maybe a better course that they want to take or there's a schedule conflict and they drop that course within the time that's allotted for them to drop out of that course and they're still getting penalized by the high school. So that is the problem we're trying to fix. It's not the other way around where like principals have tons of students dropping out of course and then they have not they don't know what to do with it and they've paid for it so I just want to clarify that point but I am open to people who are in the higher ed uh, um, you know have the higher ed experience to work with us on clarifying the language that's a little ambiguous mm -hmm. so. so I think I think we've, we covered that point thank you <laughs> representative Hassan for the for for the concluding word and the uh, uh, Acknowledging that we can use further work on that, but can find something that best satisfies all the parties. Other discussion points? <laughs> and I will turn to Representative Bennett, because we are, we do want to move on if, if, if that's fine with the committee member. Sure, I have Bennett. two questions. Hopefully it will be uh, fairly quick. And uh, thanks for this bill. Lots of components in it. Um, so a question, Representative Hassan. First of all, quick comment about the MCAs. The MCAs, you know, there's debate, good or bad, they were developed by teachers and they were analyzed for bias. So just so we know that those 
that was set up ahead of time, but I do understand some people still don't like them, and I get that. If the MCAs are not going to be used, the, the eighth grade test has been stricken out of this, then what academic standard is used to determine if students are, who want to take these PSEO courses are at grade level for especially reading and math, because they obviously need to be at grade level in order to go to college level. So what standard is used to assure that those students are academically prepared for PSEO? Representative Tsai. Uh, Madam Chair and uh, Rep. Uh, Bennett, um, I'm going to go back to the point that I made earlier. Uh, we will agree to disagree on the MCAs, but the students who are, you know, interested in PSEOs are, are not the failing students. They're not the ones that are struggling with reading. They're not the ones that are struggling with math. They're bright and brilliant students who want uh, a pathway to college. That's my understanding of what PSEO option is. Uh, but I also want to um, hear from uh, my testifier here if you want to add on something. Yeah, that's yes, um, Mr. Jackson. Uh, thank yes. you, Zeke thank Jackson. You. I apologize. Um, so, point is well taken. The um, this bill being introduced last year has received a lot of feedback, and that's something that we've consistently heard. So, people for PSEOs is open to more discussion about um, you know what was a good way to amend that to to satisfy folks. Uh, Representative, Bennett. thanks, Madam Chair, and thank you both of you. So I, I would encourage some type of assessment. It's just like even in sports, kids go through a, a brief physical to determine if they're capable of performing in that sport. I think it's very important with academics to show a student is prepared so they're not getting in over their head, as that principal or administrator said. Uh, we don't want to set kids up for failure. We also want to make sure it's open to many different students of um, you know varying backgrounds. So I think having some kind of academic standard. If the MCAs are not it, there needs to be something else in my mind. Second quick question, um, just clarification, if you could, Representative Hassan. On, lines two point, on line 2.1, it talks about the alternative pupil, which would be non-public uh, and homeschool. They must receive, or, or, they must have a passing MCA score. But on two, line 2.14 and 1.5, it removes the requirement for the passing score for the public students. And so could you clarify that our alternative pupils, non-public and homeschool, also do not uh, have to have the MCA passing score? Is that, it's a little confusing to me. Representative Hassan. Uh, Madam Chair and Rep. Bennett, um, I believe we would have consistent for both uh, public and non-public, so we would, we would have to uh, look at this language again. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Appreciate that. And yeah, Representative Bennett, our intent is to lay this over, and, and it's good to have the hearing, get, good to get the questions, and we can look at some of these areas and, and make sure that our, our language is, is clear Appreciate moving it. forward. Thanks. And I think uh, if that's member discussion, if there's further questions, I think that the, the bill author is open um, to, to meeting and clarify, um, take some suggestions as this bill is being laid over. We'll turn to you, Representative Hassan. Any closing comments at this point to um, leave us with before we lay the <laughs> bill over? <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair and members, for the discussion. And like I said, we're open to uh, some change to the bill. And feel free to reach out to me or... Um, to people for PSEO um, uh, folks, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for being with us, for bringing your students and uh, former students. Mm -hmm. Appreciate hearing about this. Um, and with that, we are laying the bill over. Mm -hmm. All right, so next up, we have uh, Representative Feist has a bill, 3484. <laughs> And this is relating to charter schools. And if you have a testifier that um, will be with you, that's probably a good time to move up, move somebody up to the, yeah. All right.
All right, uh, this is House File 3484 members. It's our intention to lay over House File 3484 for further consideration. Representative Feist, would you like to motion your bill before us? So moved, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right, please introduce yourself for the committee, you, though you're well known. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the committee. And proceed with your testimony. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Feist, um, District 39B, very excited to be working with the charter schools on this legislation. Um, House File 3484 builds upon bipartisan work that has gone into improving Minnesota charter school law since its inception in 1991. This bill was written in consultation and collaboration with stakeholders to address numerous issues charter schools have asked for clarity on, to address issues that have arisen through mistakes or gaps in accountability structures uh, that have led to problems for school communities, and to be proactive on possible issues that could come up in the future. Key provisions include uh, clarification of legal definitions, such as conflict of interest issues, board eligibility for teachers, and anti-nepotism policies. It also enhances chartered or charter school board governance by strengthening training requirements and charter school conflict of interest provisions. It also changes board terms of office to better match the school year calendar, uh, starting on July 1st. Uh, it also clarifies and enhances professional development requirements for school administrators. This bill requires yearly training for licensed administrators and requires yearly training for unlicensed administrators on essential areas such as instruction and assessment, financial management, and state accounting. Um, I know I'm going kind of fast, but the real expert is here, so he can dive into the details. Um, lastly, uh, this bill clarifies the role of authorizers and the Minnesota Department of Education in the accountability process. This bill outlines the role of authorizers more clearly in statute. It strengthens language on the authorizer accountability review process, um, and it strengthens transparency requirements in this process as well. Um, it, it also strengthens authorizer conflict of interest policies, such as prohibiting charter school employees or board members from serving on the board of the school's authorizer. Uh, the point of this bill is to help provide improved guidance and clarity for chartered public school leaders, boards, and authorizers, and strengthen accountability for the sector overall. With over 100 and AG chartered public schools operating in Minnesota, the continued maintenance and improvement of charter school law is essential to sustaining a healthy sector that serves our public school students innovatively and effectively. Um, and now I will invite the bill testifiers to share their expertise. Um, and um, we did have the order to be the remote testifiers first, um, and then Mr. Sienan can wrap it up as like the big expert. So mm -hmm. if that works for you. It does. Perfect. All right. So we are queuing it up. Um, I have uh, Dr. Meg Cavalier, former executive director, uh, St. Paul City Schools. Um, if you can hear us, please unmute yourself and proceed. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Dr. Meg Cavalier, and I am a licensed teacher, principal, and superintendent. I served as the executive director for 16 years at St. Paul City School, just a block west of the Capitol on University Avenue. St. Paul City School is in its 25th year and currently serves just over 600 students. When compared with the state averages, the school has higher percentages of those who speak more than one language and those who qualify for free or reduced meals. Last month, I transitioned to the role of Chief Network Officer for Collaborative Student Transportation, a national organization located in Northeast Minneapolis, committed to providing safe and reliable special education and McKinney-Vento transportation. I continue to support charter schools in an advisement capacity. My formal training through a licensure program had a direct impact on my ability to meet the unique needs of a charter school. As a mentor of mine shared, a charter school leader is running a school and a small business. Minnesota state law does not require an administrative license for charter school leaders. I fully support this approach. However, there must be consistent professional development provided to leaders to ensure the health of charter schools and increase the retention of school leaders. In the last five years, 43% of Minnesota charter schools have had at least one director turnover. According to Buckman in 2021, school leaders play a vital role in the educational environment. Studies have shown that schools with principal turnover show, show a decrease in student achievement, poor school climate and culture, and lower graduation rates. There's also financial costs associated with leader replacement and a negative impact on teacher turnover. As you know, the school finance is complex, and this is compounded in smaller schools. 
Charter school leaders often function as principal, superintendent, and business manager. It's a tough job to do well. The high turnover in this role limits a person's ability to gain experience. There have been several instances where my formal training via the licensure program and the professional development that I independently sought helped me grow as a charter school leader. There are many internal and external factors that have a significant impact on school finance and cash flow, such as enrollment, flow of funds from the state, and demographics, to only name a few. Consistent professional development will ensure that all charter school leaders have access and are accountable to best practice. This is not something that should be learned on the job. In closing, I fully support the suggested re revision to 124.e.12 to include required trainings for charter school leaders in the areas of instruction and assessment, curriculum design, human resource and personnel management, professional ethics, child development, financial management, legal and compliance management, special education oversight, contract management, effective communication, cultural competency, board and authorizer relationships, parent relationships, and community partnerships. Thank you for consideration and for your time this afternoon. Thank you. Next up, we have Henry Shatson, um, Buffalo Montessori School. If you can unmute yourself and proceed. Thank you and good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Henry Shanson. I am the head of school or the director of Bluffy Montessori in Winona and therefore I'm an ex officio school board member. I've been working at Bluffy Montessori for 17 years now and currently in my seventh year as the head of school. Previously uh, to being the head of the school, I was a mixed age kindergarten and preschool teacher here for 10 years. I spent eight of those years as a member of the board of directors, four of which was in the role of board chair. When the previous head of school resigned, I was elevated by my peers. Charter school governance is extremely complicated. New members must be trained in their roles and responsibilities, employment practices and policies, and financial management, among other things. Board members also engage in ongoing training. We accomplish, accomplish this at Bluffview with a two-year cycle, addressing at least one topic each month, generally more. The non-exhaustive list includes charter law, school bylaws, nonprofit law, open meeting law, wage theft law, and data practices. In honor of Eugene Piccolo, I would like to share one of his direct messages always to board members. Ignorance is not a legal defense in a court of law, urging board members to be well educated in the law when they take action. As a Montessori school, we include a philosophical element as well. Specific to Montessori, such as the four planes of development, sensitive period, the absorbent mind, and the work of the child. We want our board members to be well versed in what they're governing. <coughs> it's imperative to that they know the why behind what we're doing. The most important and overlooked skill set in governing a charter school is that the director and other board members must have strong soft skills as well, meaning non-technical skills like interpersonal skills, active listening, problem solving, teamwork, and above all, my opinion, pragmatism. Here's a great example. Mm -hmm. As the head of school, I administer and complete the teacher and staff evaluation. My school board is a teacher majority board, therefore, the same teachers that I evaluate and manage as professionals also then administer my annual evaluation and are the ones that govern the school. We have to work together in harmony, harmony and unison for the school to be successful. Contentious relationship there would be problematic on many levels. I believe we have a well-functioning school board because we have a plan, we work together to problem solve, review and discuss financial and academic data, and review policies ad nauseum together. Currently, charter school law does require ongoing training, but it's vague and without specification. The goal of this bill is to refine statutory language with clear, concise language that will guarantee boards run effectively and efficiently by requiring training in areas including but not limited to finance and budget, charter law, nonprofit law, employment policies, and programmatic oversight. We want, above all else, high performing, successful boards that understand good governance so that their decisions positively influence the lives of the teachers, families, and students they serve by ensuring high-functioning charter schools so that the students receive the best possible education. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Uh, finally, on remote, we have Eliza Rafa. If you can unmute yourself and please proceed, and um, we, 
we want to make sure that we have time for measured discussion. So um, we hope that the next testimonies are moving along, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Madam Chair and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify about the Charter School Administrator provisions in House File 3484. My name is Elisa Rafa. I'm the Executive Director of Minnesota Online High School, which we call Minnows, a public charter school now in its 19th year of operation. I became licensed in Minnesota as a high school science teacher in 1984. The first 20 years of my career were in two large district alternative programs, both of which gave me opportunities to develop as a leader. In 2004, three colleagues and I founded Minnows, where I started as academic director. In 2008, I enrolled in a Master of Education program at Bemidji State University, and through that program did the coursework required to add a district superintendent endorsement to my license. This filled in some of the gaps in my qualifications, especially in the areas of assessment, human resource management, and financial management. In 2012, the executive director of Minnows resigned, and I felt well-equipped to accept the position. Since then, I've mostly relied on the Minnesota Department of Education, the Minnesota Association of Charter Schools, and other organizations for ongoing training and support. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> Since it was first passed, Minnesota's charter statute has created professional opportunities for teachers like me to innovate on behalf of students, and this is wonderful. Leaders of small to medium charters wear many hats and must develop knowledge and skills in many areas, some common to all school districts and some unique to chartering. I support the proposed new policy language on charter administration because it supports school leaders' success by requ requiring training and support and by establishing accountability that has been lacking. At the same time, it makes room for many paths to success depending on an individual leader's academic background, employment history, and skill set. It gives charter schools the latitude to develop leaders from within or to hire those with more traditional training and make sure they understand about charters' unique needs. I encourage the committee to pass this bill to ensure effective school leadership for Minnesota's public charter school students. Thank you very much for your consideration and time. Thank you for your testimony. So we'll hear from our, our last testifier, and I do want to make note for the committee that for many years uh, since the beginning of the charter school movement, we had a, a different executive director. We appreciate uh, Mr. Eugene Piccolo's work, uh, but we have a new executive director, and so we are very, um, would like to welcome you, and um, Mr. Joey Kenyon, if you would introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. And thank you for being, and thank you for stepping up and, and fulfilling this role now. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Joey Chenyon, and I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Association of Charter Schools. Thank you for this opportunity to speak today. Minnesota Charter Public Schools are tuition-free, uh, independent public schools that are open and welcome to all students, no matter ability or need, and are governed and operated jointly by licensed teachers, parents, and community members. This bill, HF 3484, presented before you today, encompasses what we see as the important next steps in accountability and transparency to improve Minnesota's charter school law. We have worked on this bill consulting with schools and many important stakeholders in our sector to proactively strengthen the law and in turn continue to strengthen our schools so they have the appropriate guidance and training to continue to effectively govern and serve their students, families, and communities at the highest level. Today we'll highlight three quick areas of the bill that work to strengthen accountability and transparency. First, this bill clarifies and enhances professional development requirements for charter school administrators. Based on internal calculations at Minnesota Association of Charter Schools, over the past five years, there have been over 100 school director turnovers in Minnesota charter public schools. That's a turnover rate estimated at about 10.8% a year. Many folks stepping into new administrative roles come from traditional districts, former licensed principals or superintendents. And many are unlicensed professionals that come from other fields or expertise, such as teachers, business, or nonprofit community leaders. Considering recent turnover rates and the diversity of school leadership experiences, improved and expansive training requirements and statute will help our school leaders continue to be successful. This bill requires yearly training for unlicensed administrators on important things such as instruction and assessment, financial management, or special education law. 
and it requires training for new licensed administrators in their first year on unique areas working to working in charters. This bill also enhances charter public school board governance by enhancing board training requirements amongst other changes such as strengthening conflict of interest provisions. Finally, this bill clarifies the role of authorizers in statute. Authorizers have an extremely important role in the accountability structure for chartered public schools as they conduct monitoring, oversight, and the evaluation of academic, operational, and financial performance in the contracts they oversee. This bill outlines their role more clearly in statute and strengthens language on the authorizer accountability review process with MDE. This bill also strengthens conflict of interest requirements such as prohibiting a chartered public school employee or a board member from serving on the board of the school's authorizer. It also strengthens transparency as it requires findings from the authorizer's performance review process to be shared with the schools that they authorized. It requires training of authorizer staff on the roles and responsibilities to be documented. And it requires the school termination hearings to be recorded, preserved, and made public. We've worked with multiple authorizers on negotiations on the language of this bill. They are not opposed to the language in this bill. Strengthening accountability structures, enhancing clarity and transparency in statutory requirements, and continuing to strengthen conflict of interest protections will help all of Minnesota's charter public schools continue to successfully carry out the important purpose of chartering. We encourage you to pass this bill, HF 3484, which we call the next steps of accountability for charter public schools to continue to strengthen Minnesota's charter public school law. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for being with us today. Um, so we do have time for member discussion. Um, if we have questions or comments that we'd like to make at this point, and then there is another bill that we do have that we'd like to hear today. So um, we'll be watching the time, and we know that this bill is being laid over. And if there's questions and issues that we're not fully able to uh, explore and resolve in this meeting, I know that the bill author is available uh, for further consultation. So at this point. Member comments and questions? Yes, Chair Yuki. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just wanted to thank Mr. Sinan for bringing this bill and putting it all together with Representative Feist. I think it's a good bill on accountability measures and look forward to seeing it go through the process. <laughs> Representative Keeler. Thank you, Chair Pryor. Um, Representative Feist, it's um, so I don't have a charter school, so I just kind of want to ask a clarifying question about the training for um, administrators without the license that we need for superintendents and principals. So it says in here that it's 25 hours of annual training. Can you just tell me how that compares to the ongoing training that our administrators in public schools have to continue each year? Is that comparable? Is that the same? Is that less than? Is that more? Can you tell me what that comparison is like? I'll let Mr. Chen Noon, whose name I now know how to pronounce, because he wrote it down, um, answer that question. Mr. It's 14.27 uh, is where it is mm -hmm. in the bill. Mr. Chen Noon. Yeah, I, I think uh, other experts can qualify the training that traditional public school directors will have. But if you look at the uh, 25 hours of training in the bill, it lists off many of the things and, and most of the competencies that a professional uh, license, a principal's license would require. Uh, basically, this training includes, but is not limited to, a whole host of things that are really important, instruction and curriculum, state standards, teacher staff hiring, so on and so forth. Um, it correlates, I think, directly to the training that our licensed professionals will have. Representative Keeler. Thanks. I still don't think that's really answering my question as far as the hour requirement. Like, no. the list of things they can do, I, I see. I am more wondering, um, and I don't know, maybe the principal in the room can answer like what the requirements are, because I, I don't know. I'm just trying to figure out if this is an, an equal space that we're asking of our administrators and our public schools for ongoing annual training is all I'm trying to clarify in the 24-hour question. Sorry to put you Representative Bakeford. Um, <clears throat> when I look at this list, it looks like the, the competencies of an administrator as I'm glancing at it. And, um, and then, and I, I just, Actually, before we came, I renewed my license again. Mm -hmm. um, How long did it take? I, I, <laughs> yeah. How many hours? That's a really good, I think it was 125 hours um, in different competency areas. What's that? 
up <coughs> for five years. Yes, for five years. For, for five years. So, yep. um, and that's, I mean, to be honest, it was super easy to, to meet that 125 hours for five years. So it, it's, yeah. But I think the, the part that you know, we have to look at is that all, all principals that go through that, they're already licensed, so they've already gone through a, a program with competencies um, and, and intensive programs there, so I would see a difference. Mm -hmm. Any more comments or mostly resolve this, this issue? Thank you. Thank you. Representative Hill. Yes, thank you, Chair, and um, thank you for bringing the bill. I, I think it's important. I, you know, one thing I would add to uh, what Representative Bakeberg said is uh, before principals are into a position where they're looking for renewal with that matching hour com hourly component, um, have to put hundreds of hours of uh, experience be, you know, in their rearview mirror before they're eligible to be licensed uh, with their initial licensure. And so I think it's an important step to take um, to ensure that the leaders of these important institutions are qualified and, um, and ready to be successful. I'll turn to Representative Bennett. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just a quick question. I'm not sure if it'll be for Bill Author or, or Max. Um, and, and thank you for this. I think there's some good components in it. But I am wondering, so um, Max, can I say it that way? Is that okay? <laughs> um, represents about 50% of our public or our charter schools in Minnesota. So I'm just wondering, do the other 50% know about this? Has it been circulated amongst all those schools? And I, I just think it's important that this info get out so that feedback can come back. Mr. Chender. We meet with charter public schools across the state on a whole host of issues and discuss our policy agenda. These legislative priorities were ratified by our members in uh, for the 23-24 session. And basically, our legislative agenda priorities are based on the public policy pos positions that are ratified by our members, approved by at least 60% uh, for us to work forward on this stuff. And, and we have conversations with schools uh, all the time on these issues. Um, we work with, there. there's 180 different schools in the state, so I haven't heard directly from every single school leader on this, but we're always open to consideration and review from different folks because they are so different all across the state serving different missions to look at the language and bills like this and make sure that it's it's versatile uh, for the diversity of our community. I was noticing it here and I was like, what is that? <laughs> oh, it's just the mask. Off. It's funny, I was noticing and I was like, that's distracting for us. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chair, if I could ask one more yes. quick follow-up. Representative Bennett. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. So just a question then, um, because that's good to reach out, but I'm wondering if it's just to that 50%. Um, what, who are the stakeholders for your group? What? Sure. So we, we're working with um, authorizers. We're working with charter school leaders across the state. We're working with other organizations that work on these issues. Uh, we're in consultation with MDE on these issues, and we're in consultation with teachers, board members, uh, and administrators at schools in the metro and greater Minnesota and all across the state. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Bennett. Concluding remarks. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks so much for the great discussion. Um, I think this is a really important bill. Um, I've toured charter schools that are amazing and doing really innovative, exciting work. Um, I've also heard from communities that have felt like charter schools haven't always met their needs. Um, and I feel like, in particular, the role of the authorizer is really important, and I'm really excited to enhance that role um, through this legislation. And I've also heard about charter schools that a lot of times, like, their success or, or failure is a lot tied to kind of that leadership. Um, and so I think enhancing the training of the administrators is particularly important in this context. So I hope you can support this bill. Thank you. And shouldn't we say before we close that charter schools are public schools? Yep. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you for the presentation, um, and thank you for the discussion. Um, we have then, I want to get your bill number here. 3484. The 30, 34, yes, 3484 is laid over for the consideration. Thank you. Thank you.
Thanks. All right, Representative Jordan. Thank you for joining us. We're pulling you away from your usually scheduled <laughs> committee meeting. I'm glad that you can be with us. All right. And I'll just start by saying, as we know, Representative Jordan is not currently a member of this committee, though she is in spirits. <laughs> She's with us. Continues on with the hearing about education policy. Um, so um, for House File 3556, Representative Berg, would you um, make the motion to bring this before us for consideration? Thank you, Madam Chair. I move uh, 3550, House File 3556 before the committee. Thank you, Representative Berg. So welcome back to your committee. Welcome back to the committee, Representative Jordan. Please introduce yourself and proceed with the testimony. Thank you, Chair Pryor. Um, and thank you, members. It's, it's good to be back in education policy. I do miss serving on this committee. Um, maybe, maybe next year, you never know. Um, but good afternoon. As I said, my name is Sydney Jordan. I represent Northeast Minneapolis and Southeast Como here. Um, and today I'm here to present House File 3556, which is a bill to ensure students receive enough time to eat lunch. Uh, this is a bill to strengthen our successful universal school meals program, which as you all know, passed on a bipartisan vote and was signed into law by Governor Tim Walz less than a year ago. Uh, since then, I've heard from school districts, parents, and especially students about how transformational that bill has been for student success and happiness and family budgets. Um, and the great news is, is that Minnesotans love the work we did to feed their kids more Minnesota children are eating breakfast and lunch at school with 30% more breakfasts and 16% more school lunches being served from the start of the school year versus 2022 when we did not have a universal meal program. Um, and a recent KSTP poll showed that 70% of Minnesotans support universal school meals and those numbers are even higher amongst our parents. Um, NPR also did recent reporting on the quality of meals being served and found that the more students eat lunch at school, the better the food gets. So to briefly explain this bill, um, it's, it's a short bill, uh, which is not always what I write, but um, <laughs> this bill would ensure that students have 15 minutes to eat the lunch. So as written, uh, the 15 minutes would start after the student has received their lunch and does not include walking to and from the cafeteria or standing in line to wait for a lunch. The bill only applies to lunch as many students utilize the breakfast after the bell model um, for breakfast distribution. And the feedback I have gotten from families um, is that the problem with the compressed meal times is more of a lunchtime problem. Furthermore, the 15 minutes is a floor. School districts are welcome, and I would personally encourage them to give more time to students to eat their lunch. And so members, while lunch lines are longer, than they were uh, before we were feeding all children. This was a problem before we acted last year. Students, parents, and educators have bemoaned a lack of time to eat during the day for years. And in fact, over a quarter of other states have enshrined, and the District of Columbia have enshrined minimum lunch times for students. Um, I could list the schools, but every time I do a Google search, I find a new uh, state that has passed a similar piece of legislation. Um, but one that I would note is New Mexico which also has universal school meals and has a mandated 20 minutes for students to have time to eat. The CDC, in fact, recommends that students receive at least 20 minutes again to eat lunch during the day. And the Journal of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, I think that's how you pronounce that, found that students who didn't receive at least 20 minutes ate less nutritious meals. So students were less likely to select a piece of fruit and ate less of their entree and fewer vegetables. So I think we can all think about that in real life. We can think about, you know, peeling a clementine or an orange, or I know it takes me a lot longer to eat a salad than it does to eat a bag of chips, which is unfortunate for me. Um, but the bill is being laid over, members, and so it's continuing to be worked on, especially around some of the implementation. So I'm looking more at what other states are doing around implementation, because I think we know that other states are able to do it, but I know that districts are looking for more support. I've had conversations with several of those districts and I'm particularly grateful to Josh Downham from Minneapolis Public Schools and Scott Grunquist with the Association of Metropolitan School Districts for their feedback and their willingness to continue to bring ideas forward. And I welcome your feedback as well. Um, but before we get to that, I would like to hear from our testifiers, Madam Chair. Right now, 
They're not here. <laughs> well, I have some that are in the oh, building. Oh, good, good. Bring this. That's we, are, we are waiting on a student that is participating. Oh, sorry. Mark. Remote, wait, excuse me. So this is a behind the scenes moment. Sorry, sorry, committee members. Um, if you have an in-person testifier, uh, please have that person come forward. Right. So please, welcome to our committee. Identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Hello, Chair Pryor and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Kelly Kozel. Um, I currently am on long-term leave, but I do work in Roseville um, Public School District as a nutrition um, assistant. Um, I am also a mom of a special needs um, student. Um, who has autism, and um, that's partly why I got into um, school nutrition. Um, I just want to thank the Universal um, Cameron Talk Universal School Program. Um, it's very highly successful and much appreciated um, for so many families across of our state. It's it's wonderful. So going back to uh, why I support HF3556, um, in the lens of being a service worker, um, there is long lines. And um, I would just like to give the opportunity for students actually to have seated time of 15 minutes, um, having you know a 20 minute total lunch time. And if you spend 75% of it in line, it doesn't give the opportunity for the child to um, eat all their food or um, sometimes just the anxiety of the lines itself is, um, it's so overwhelming. Kids choose for many reasons not to eat. So I, I truly believe with the long lines, my, what I've seen even before universal um, meals and after. Um, from my experience, my son um, has adapted to the rush of school lunch. He eats dinner very, very fast. Um, my husband's not familiar with public schools and how fast kids have to eat, and so he always questions me, like, why is he eating so fast? And it's like, because that's what they have to do in lunch. Um, he oftentimes comes home um, from school hungry if... You know, he, he'll say little things like, you know, something happened at lunch or, you know, this person, this class got um, behind. Um, while I understand the emphasis of schools placing time in the classroom, our children deserve at least 15 minutes seated time to eat lunch. By meeting the basic need, they will also be more successful students. Um, so that's basically from a parent and as well as um, from um, MSNA, which is the Minnesota School Nutrition Program. Um, that's why I support this bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Oh, we have both. Oh, wonderful. We have, yep. Patrick. All right. I think next we have a, a student, uh, Kam Kamaya. If you can hear us, would you please unmute yourself and introduce yourself to the committee? Hello. Hello. Committee. My name is Kamaya Oliver. Yep, we can, we can hear you. I, okay. Yes. Oh, okay. And basically, I am a, I'm 19. I graduated Chaska High School. And, but I also went to like multiple other high schools in like Albert Lee and Eden Prairie and yeah, in Chaska. So um, I've had 
like different experiences throughout high school with lunch. And um, I don't know, I just didn't really ever eat that much of lunch because it wasn't too appealing to me. And even when I like had to eat lunch, it was because, um, I mean, I wouldn't have like no time to eat lunch because the lines are so long. And then when you finally get lunch, then the bell rings, and you gotta go to class. And it's like, it's a really bad situation. And I honestly think 15 minutes isn't even enough time even after seated, because how are you even supposed to keep track of like when each student seats? Like by the time each student sits down, it's gonna be probably an hour, like guaranteed, like depending on how big the school is. Like at Eden Prairie, those lines were huge. So, and we had four different lunch rooms. It was just a real concern. And then one more thing that I wanted to talk about was um Yeah, that was it. Just um the qual sorry, the qual the quality of the food and also the quantity. Um yeah, the quantity is like crazy because we have growing boys. The I just looked at a lunch today, one of the school lunches, and I'm like, wow, this is literally a snack for a growing boy. Crazy. Um, yeah, so, and also all lunches need to be free to everybody because everybody, it's just, it's a right. Like how could you turn down food to a child like that's it's unbelievable to me I haven't really seen too many students get turned down but I did talk to a few students in Albert Lee that would bring their own lunch because their parents make too much and I think that really sucks because it just it creates like social issues as well all right, so, so we, we appreciate your testimony That's it. <laughs> and the schools that you've attended. We can relate. <laughs> we can relate. Um, we do have one more testifier, um, Michelle Hawkinson. If you can unmute yourself and, and proceed. And we are getting to close to our, our session, so we hope we can hear your testimony and move on to member discussion. Madam Chair, members, I'm Michelle Hawkinson, Food Service Director at Teresa Area Schools and the President of the Minnesota School Nutrition Association, and I'm here to offer MSNA's support for 15 minutes for seat time found at HF3556. As you're aware, during the 2023 legislative session, a monumental bill was passed to offer one free breakfast and lunch to students on school days. This bill has led to an increase in participation in school meals. We have received many thanks from parents and students as it has been a tremendous help to families around the state. As we are thrilled that more students are receiving our nutritional meals, it has resulted in students not receiving the time they need to properly eat their lunch. Many times students are still eating their lunch when it's time for their class to leave to, to go to school. This is a resulting students being rushed, eating too fast, or throwing away the food that have fueled them for the rest of the day. Lunch is supposed to be the time for students to relax, catch up with friends, and enjoy a good meal. Creating a positive school meal environment, including providing adequate time to eat once a child receives their meals, is a proven strategy to help students reach their full academic potential and to improve their overall health and well being. Studies have shown that longer school lunch periods are associated with increased student consumption of healthy foods. Choices such as more fruits, vegetables, and less plate waste. Additionally, there is a direct correlation between a healthy diet and the student's ability to learn and thrive. In order for students to receive the nutrition they need to learn, MSNA would urge you to vote yes for HS, HF3556. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Ms. Hawkinson. 
We can now move to member discussion, uh, questions, and I have Representative Keeler. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Representative Jordan. I think it's very clear that I also love feeding Minnesota border to border, and that includes our schools um, and many other places. I, I have a couple questions more about how this actually works as we do it, right? Because one of the things that we know is that there are much longer lines because of what we did. I, I think that a big part of that would be, do you know in that change how many districts hired more nutrition service or food service employees? Because it's, I think part of it is that when you only have two people serving the food, it's hard to move these lines quickly. Um, and so I'm interested to know that, and it can be something that a de the department or the food advocates can get back to me because I, I think that's maybe part of the issue. The other thing, as I've carried other bills, that we really get time specific for schools that can increase the length of their day and that increases teacher contracts and how long they're in schools, right? And so that's another beast that we would have to um, approach. Are those conversations, or can you explain to us how those conversations are working behind the scenes? Because um, as we've learned, when we tell our schools they need to do something and we don't provide honest solutions with that, um, it's hard to hold them accountable for that. And so, in my opinion, this is wonderful, and I absolutely agree. Just wonder what the financial component is it to provide our nutrition services with more staff so that they can move kids through these lines quicker. And Representative Jordan, um, can you address these questions for, at, for this committee, which is the policy, but, and then I know that you're going to be doing uh, further conversations in the Ed Finance Committee also. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair Pryor, and thank you, Representative Keeler, for both the questions and your deep commitment to feeding everyone. Um, you know, I know that I have heard anecdotally that schools have, in, like, hired more people. I have also heard of schools wanting to hire more people um, to work in nutrition staff. I've also, I mean, heard from school districts and from, from nutrition workers that a lot of the work that we did last year to, to help those workers as well has helped with job retain, has helped people retain those jobs over the summer. Um, I don't have those numbers on how many school districts have done um, more hiring as a result of this. Um, and so we're looking at what, I'm currently looking at what other states are doing, specifically New Mexico. Um, and you know, I hate to admit this, but the New Mexico governor, as there was part of their universal school meals was their seat time because they had found that if they just said, schools get a half hour for lunch, that students were still not getting, even before they passed universal meals, at least 20 minutes to eat. Um, and so as a component of their universal school meals bill, they built, that is that is now in place, they, are, they have built in um, that lunchtime. I know other seats, I know I think it's, there's like 25 states that have, that have laws like this in place, and I know about 12 of them have that seat time. Um, and so I think looking at what other states have done and getting feedback from districts, I mean, including yours would be helpful on what they've done would, would be good for that. I think there's also, there's, there's more work we can do. The bill's being laid over for, to, to continue to, to have that work. So I think that's one of those ongoing questions about implementation, I think. And you know, I mean, 15 minutes is, is very much the floor and it is critical that we're actually getting that time because we do have schools that are huge. I went to a school that had like 2,000 kids and it would take me five minutes you know, in high school, to walk to the cafeteria. Um, so that's also part of it, too, is sometimes that, that, that transit time can be difficult, especially as we heard, you know, Eden Prairie has multiple cafeterias and multiple buildings. Uh, you know, not every school is the same. And so I think, you know, if there's a school that does have this a much smaller student body or a smaller footprint, that might look different than how the implementation would work in a school um, that has 2,000 kids. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I have one other follow-up question. Thank you for that. Count me in to, for whatever we need to do to look at data to make sure that we can do this. Um, the next thing is I, I just kind of want to ask and verify, are we using 504 plans and IEPs to address this from a special education standpoint? I know that you mentioned your son probably would have identified or qualified for an IEP. Um, is, are we utilizing that tool to make sure that students who maybe have outside needs and need longer time we're utilizing the IEP 504 um, network to address the seat time for food as well. And I would need to defer to us. Right. And, um, if it's all right, Representative Keeler, I think that's an excellent question and that um, I, I think we'll leave that for the author to, to get back to us on, on what the answer to that is um, and how that works. 
if, is, is that satisfactory for today? Yeah, I, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm not an IEP or special education expert, so I'm not quite sure how but that all goes into effect, but that would be something to look into. Right, but, it, but not to dismiss the question, but to make sure that we get the, the best, in, best an answer available. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go, uh, Representative Lee. Thank you, Chair. Uh, very quickly, I was excited to see we are talking about this. Uh, wanted to know, I know we're laying this over, so wondering if you've considered um, also writing school breakfast into this. Uh, during the interim, I met with teachers, and um, some of the older students aren't, like, getting enough time to have breakfast in the morning, and so um, wanted to ask about that, and also wanted to amplify uh, Rep Keeler's question about staff time. Um, I also understand um, sometimes there is pressure to shift from preparing breakfast to lunch, and so that justifies some of, like, the shorter times in the morning when schools are, are serving breakfast. Um, I know we don't have that much time, but would love to chat and work with you on this. Just wanted to note that was a concern that teachers had um, and administrators had brought up during the interim. Representative Jordan. Thank you, Madam Chair. And then to the to the breakfast. Breakfast is not included in this because many, like the, the most school districts, utilize breakfast after the bell. Um, and so that would be a that's so you we don't have a breakfast time where students go and sit in a cafeteria and eat a bunch of pancakes. They they get like a cereal bar and some milk to go um, and eat that during homeroom or the first period. And so if we were going to include breakfast as part of that, um, it would need to be able to accommodate breakfast after the bell. And I, think, I think if there's more questions, um, there's a great deal of interest in this bill, and um, we'll, uh, I think the author would be willing to uh, follow up. And Representative Bennett, do you have a question or comment at this point before we lay this bill over? So, uh, closing remarks? <laughs> yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members. I'm um, looking forward to hearing from all of you on this. I think this is a, I think we can all agree that it is extremely common sense to give kids at least 15 minutes as a floor to eat. And that's what I really want us to focus on is kids need time to eat. Um, I mean, I think we all agree that we do better when we have time to eat and focus on our food. And the other thing I want people to keep in mind is how important social and emotional learning is as part of our school day. And lunch is really where we teach that. That's a, that's a class period where, where kids learn how to be friends and have, uh, you know, lunchtime conversations with each other. And if you haven't had a chance to go and listen to elementary school kids uh, converse over lunch, you are missing out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And with that, the chair lays over House File 3556. Um, and, yeah, and, and we are also adjourned. Thank you.